We're so excited you're here with us today. We might be worshiping from different places, but we're still together. We're still pursuing God as one body. Come on, let's sing together today.
Hey friends, it's so glad to see you. Thanks for joining us today. And happy Mother's Day, everybody. Hey, we know that Mother's Day can be challenging for some of us. Uh, maybe you can't be with your mom today for different reasons, or some of you may have this soul longing to be a mom yourselves and that just hasn't happened yet. But Mother's Day is about so much more than just maternal matters. It's about celebrating any woman who's had a great influence on our lives. I mean, think about it. Where would we be without all the great women in history? I'm willing to bet that you've been impressed by some pretty great women in your lifetime. So today's the day, let's celebrate them. Maybe it's an aunt, a grandma, somebody else's mom, a neighbor, a teacher, anyone. If it's a female that's impacted your life for the good, pick up your phone today. Just let them know what they've done for you and how important they are. And hey, if you're a female out there watching this now, you impact others, so this is for you. Happy Mother's Day. If this is your first time joining us, or if you have a prayer request you'd like to share, our team's standing by and we would love to hear from you. Just text the word CONNECT to the number on the bottom of your screen. Hey, West Cobb family, you did such a great job with our food drive the last two weeks, and the need is still so big that we're gonna continue this effort. So keep bringing your food on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, and we'll get it out to the people in our community who need it the most. Speaking of giving, thank you so much for your continued generosity supporting West Cobb Church and its mission during these times. If you'd like to give today, follow the link at the bottom of the screen. Thanks so much for joining us today. And again, happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Mom, for being awesome for me and the girls. Thank you, Grandma. We love you. Thank you for all the fun times we have together. Thanks for all that you do for us, Mom. And I appreciate you raising me to be such a good person. I am so grateful for everything that you've done for me. Thanks for always being there, no matter what, and for your constant love and support. And even though others may claim to have the best mom ever, I know I really do. From one Christian to another, my mom is the best mom. She's better than your mom. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you, Mom, for always being there for me and for teaching me what it means to be a woman of God. So thankful for all you do for me and our family. You are incredible. I love you and I hope to see you very soon. I love getting to spend time with you over quarantine, like playing games, baking, and painting. She's an amazing example of what a mother should be. Thank you for everything you've done for me over the years and everything that you've taught me. I am so thankful God chose you to be my mom. I just want you to know I love you. Have a great day. Hey, I want to wish a very happy Mother's Day to my own wife, who is the world's best mom, second only to my own mom. Thank you so much for loving me unconditionally and for being there for me through any and everything. I literally don't know what I would do without you. I love you so much. For all the times that you've hugged me when I felt like I didn't deserve it. Thanks, Thanks for, for being, being our, our number, number one fan. fan. For being my best friend and for showing me what it means to love the Lord with all your heart. There's been ups and downs. I wouldn't change a thing because I got to have you there by my side. And there has never been a day in my life that she has not been there encouraging me, praying for me. I just love moms. I love my mom especially because she has helped me become the mom I am today to my kids. To my mom and my beautiful wife, I could not have become the man that I am today without their love and support. Every mom, grandma, aunt, big sister, anyone who's brought a kid to church on Sunday, you guys are the best and we love you.
you won't it out coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Church, we've got a new song for you guys this morning, and it's called The Blessing. And as we were preparing this week, my husband and I were sitting down and talking about this song and how excited we were to introduce it to the church. And there's actually a line in the song that says, May his presence go before you, behind you, beside you, and all around you. And Spencer told me that this is actually a phrase that his mom used to say to him every day before he went off to school. And moms, as we celebrate you today, this is a memory that we cherish and we hold on to. We hold on to the prayer and the blessings of our moms. And this song is the heart, the heart of God for his children. So we're going to teach it to you guys today. If you know it, sing it out with us. Just worship from your couch. Worship from wherever you are. We're going to encounter his presence together.
Yesterday, the darkness was thick, the air unbreathable. Yesterday, we were defeated, lost, without hope. But that was yesterday. And now, a new day begins. The night is over. The sun is rising and darkness is on the run. Well, hello everyone and happy Mother's Day weekend. If you're just now joining us, my name is Stan Coleman, and I am privileged to be the lead pastor of a grace-filled grouping of people located strategically in the metro Atlanta, North Georgia, uh, Marietta, Powder Springs area, and a church called West Cobb Church. And we are just delighted to have you join us on this Mother's Day weekend. And if you're just now joining us, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or our church website or forwestcobb.com, because we are so for the community. We love where we live. We've sort of, sort of been on an incredible journey since Easter weekend, believe it or not, called 40 Days of Hope. 40 Days of Hope. We're talking about how to walk in the future of God's grace for your life. Beginning today and next week, that's all I'm going to talk about is the future. In fact, the name of the title of today's talk is Corona Apocalyptic Hope. Don't say that three times real quick because your tongue will get tied. I'm gonna talk to you about the Corona Apocalypse and the hope that we can have in the midst of all that we're going through. Since I was a teenager, I've been highly interested in eschatology, which is the study of last things, the study of the future, the study of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the most decisive, surprising, cataclysmic moment in the coming of human history will be that glorious moment when Jesus Christ returns to rescue planet Earth. Now, a lot of people these days wonder about the future. They are uncertain about the future. You may be one of them. Jesus was having conversations with his disciples who were sort of scratching their head and wondering and questioning the future. And so Jesus, did you know this? Jesus is the original Terminator. One day, Jesus actually said these words, I'll be back. Really, Stan? Really, pastor, Jesus said that? Absolutely, he did. Listen to the words of Jesus, these words of comfort to his disciples who were questioning and uncertain about their future. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. There it is. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. <clears throat> Twice in this same passage, Jesus repeats for effect, I go to prepare a place for you. I have gone to prepare a place for you. He's talking about heaven. And Jesus repeats that for effect. And then later, 23 different times, Jesus tells us in other locations in the Bible that he's coming again. It's affirmed 300 plus times in other verses in the Bible where Jesus basically is saying, I'm coming again, I'll be back. Now moms, especially on your weekend, especially new moms, when you know that a baby is going to come, what do you do? You do lots of things. You do a lot of things in advance for the preparation of the coming of the baby, right? You think about the crib that the baby's going to sleep in, the baby crib. You think about the color of the room. You think generally about the sex of the baby. You think in advance about the diapers or maybe the baby clothes or whatever it might be. You think about everything related to the coming of the child. Why? 
because you love your baby, because you love your child, because you want that child to be nurtured and to grow up and to be cared for and provided for and protected. Guess what? God is basically saying to us, Jesus in the same way is saying, I am going to go and prepare a place for you and for me. Literally, he's working on pearly gates right now. He's working on streets that will be lined with gold. He's preparing for us a mansion in a place called heaven. And here's the deal. Every minute that ticks off the clock, we get closer and closer in human history to that glorious day when God, through Jesus Christ, will return to rescue planet Earth. Now, what do we do between now and then? Between now and then, and really in the meantime, the reason we're talking in this conversation about hope this week and next week about this subject matter is because there's an incredible verse in the Bible. The great apostle Paul, the apostle of grace, he's searching for a word or a phrase. He's talking to his brother in the faith that he's mentoring by the name of Titus. And he's looking for a word or a phrase about the day of the Lord, about the second coming of Jesus. And I want you to see what he chooses. In Titus 2.13, here is what Paul says. Looking for what? Looking for our, that's yours and mine, as believers in Christ, looking for our blessed, there it is, hope, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the word blessed It gets kind of messed up, bless you when you sneeze and all. The word bless is really boiled down. It's like the word happy. The Bible says that the second coming is our happy hope. It's something that we should, with great intentionality and affection, look forward to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And so true Bible believers, true followers of Jesus Christ, have always believed that Jesus is coming again but we seldom agree on everything related to his coming. So in this two-part conversation, I could easily talk to you about things like the rapture. The rapture, pastor, are you not aware that the word rapture is not in the Bible? Yes, I'm aware the word rapture is not in the Bible. The word rapture is from the Latin word rapir, which means to snatch away. But the idea of the rapture, if you're wondering, is in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then there's the three and a half year tribulation, followed by, I believe, the three and a half year great tribulation. Then there's the bloodiest battle of all times in the Valley of Megiddo that we know as the Battle of Armageddon. Then there's the literal, the literal second coming of Jesus Christ, Uh, people riding on white horses, Uh, every eye will see him. Then there's the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus, a new heaven and a new earth on planet earth. Then there's the great white throne judgment where the devil and all his demon cohorts will be cast into the bottomless pit of hell forever and ever and ever. Now added to that, you have the antichrist, you have the false prophets, you have the mark of the beast. These days you've got ID 2020, computer chips, nanotechnology, and we've got the top 10 signs of the times that point to the imminent return of Christ. So as you can see, there's a lot of information to to dissect when it comes to eschatology, to the study of last things, to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But here's the deal. You can see by that alone, this is a very challenging subject matter, especially for a pastor. So I've sort of been praying all week long that Jesus would come back before I had to do this talk. But apparently he wasn't listening to my prayer on National Day of Prayer Week. So here we are, Jesus is tarried, welcome to the conversation. But seriously, a lot of people wanna know, what's the date when Jesus is going to return? I am gonna share with you right here, right now, publicly, you can put me on record, you can quote me on this, I'm gonna give you the exact date when Jesus Christ will return to our planet, okay? You want to know when Jesus is going to come back? You want to know what all of this is pointing to? Here is exactly, exactly when Jesus is coming back to planet Earth. Ready? I don't know. There, I said it. I don't know. It's okay to actually say I 
don't know. In fact, did you know this? If someone says, hey, I know exactly when Jesus is coming back, you should not believe them. Really, pastor, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because here's what Jesus said. No one knows. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, that is not even Jesus himself, only the Father knows. Jesus said that no one knows, only the Father knows. See, here's the deal that you need to understand. And the reason we're not gonna dissect all this information in two weeks. The Bible, the Bible, God's word, was not written to inform you or even really to inspire you only. It was written to transform you. The Bible wasn't written for your information. It wasn't written just for your inspiration although it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, it was primarily written for your transformation so that you and I would live differently as a result of what God says in the Bible. Even here, as Jesus is saying, no one knows, I want you to see what Jesus adds. He adds, be on guard, be alert. He wants to transform the way that you think about the future. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Jesus said, you don't know, I don't know, but you should be on guard, you should be alert, you should be what we call ever ready. See, God brings these things up to us and I bring these things up to you, not to freak you out, but to help you be aware of what God might be up to in the corona apocalypse. Literally, he doesn't bring it up for pandemic pandemonium. He brings it up for proper preparation. So that's what I wanna do in our time that remains. Just for effect, you should know this, Jesus talks about these end time things that will be associated with his return. All the signs of the times that maybe you've heard that phrase, the signs of the times. Here a sign, there a sign, everywhere a sign, sign. And those signs are found in Mark 13, near the verse that we just spoke about. In Matthew 24, that's my favorite. And in Luke 21. And so if you want a little bit of homework and you want to read later on tonight or tomorrow or whenever it might be, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21. Well, in Luke 21, Jesus is talking in Luke's gospel about the end times being a time of great difficulty and uncertainty and perplexity of nations. That entire nations will be perplexed and flummoxed as to what is even going on. And then Jesus adds these words, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers, the dynamite, the dynamis is the Greek word of the heavens, the Uranus uh, will be shaken. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And if you think about it, this is a time of great uncertainty. Right now, people are almost fainting with fear. They are fainting in a pandemic. They are freaking out over what is to come. They, they are living with great uncertainty. Think about it. They live with uncertainty about the next piece of bad news that's gonna come their way or the next stock market that's going to tumble or the next oil prices that are gonna crash or the next Asian hornet that's going to show up, right? We think of what's the next shoe to drop in 2020. Let's face it, the Bible is right. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. And so Jesus wants to allay your doubts and calm your fears. He wants to give you some warning and he wants to give you some comfort. So according to Jesus, and he says this in the gospel of Mark and in the gospel of Matthew, the exact same words. He says, all these are but the beginning. All these things I'm telling you about, all the signs of the end of the age are but the beginning of sorrows, sorrows. Moms, that word sorrows is the Greek word oiden. The Greek word oiden is a word for labor pain. Do you remember those? Of course you do. If you've had a baby, mom, you know, you remember, how could you forget? You know, my wife and I, you know, we've had, we have three beautiful daughters 
and we, often, we would say, we had a baby, but really she's the one who had the baby. But those labor pains don't start at conception, right? They start way, one of our babies, it was like 12 or 14 hours of all these labor pains. So they start and then they build up in intensity and in frequency right up until the boop, delivery of a beautiful baby girl or baby boy. And what Jesus is saying is in very much the same way, all these events that he's been describing in Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21 and all, they will continue to happen with increasing rapidity, contracting right up until an explosion of cataclysmic events that will yield the literal second coming of Jesus Christ to rescue planet Earth. Now, there are two huge questions that people tend to ask. Here's the first one. Pastor, are we living in the last days? Are we in the last days? The short answer is I believe that we are. I actually do. That every moment that ticks off the clock of human history brings us closer and closer and closer. The hourglass is being tilted to that final moment in human history. The apostle Paul, he is mentoring his young son in the ministry, Timothy. And in chapter three of 2 Timothy, listen to these words of Paul and see if there's not a familiar ring to what Paul is saying. But realize this, that in the what? In the last days, difficult times will come. And then he spells it out. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money. They will be boastful arrogant, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, always learning and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What an indictment on the culture that we're living in. Living this prophecy right before our eyes. These are difficult days because they are, I believe, the last days. Now you don't have to believe my opinion. Uh, you know, according to the Bible, the last days actually began when Jesus ascended to be with the Father and the Holy Spirit came upon planet Earth, the third person of the Trinity on the day of Pentecost. One day, Peter is out preaching in, to the crowd. And in Acts 2, 17, he says, in the last days, there it is again, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And what Peter is doing is he's borrowing a quote from a prophet by the name of Joel who says, you'll know the last days when the Holy Spirit is sent not to only be on people, but to be available to anyone and everyone to live not on you, but to live in you. And those days came 2000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. And so the obvious question is, pastor, if we're in the last days, and those were the last days, how can today still be the last days? Well, it's because God's perspective on time is different than my perspective on time and your perspective on time. That God is infinite and you are finite. That God knows it all and you want to be a know-it-all. Literally, God's ways are higher than, different than your ways and mine. It's like any of you have someone in your family who used to watch a sport that they called football on TV, right? They had this, this deal where these, this bag of zipped up air would sort of work its way across some chalk lines and these guys, 12 on each side, would push on each other. It's, it's a sport called football. And we used to watch it on TV. But do you remember when we, when we were watching this sport on TV that someone might say, how many minutes left in the game? And we say two minutes. But that two minutes could take 20 minutes right? It, it wasn't just 120 seconds. Well, part of what scripture teaches is that God's perspective on time is like that. It's much different than the reality of what we think it is. And so here's the way Peter describes it. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. 
He does not want anyone to perish, so he is giving more time for everyone to repent. He's slow, it seems to us, but he's not really slow. He is patient. He is enduring. He is waiting. He's giving anyone and everyone a time to come to faith in him before God the Father taps his son on the shoulder and says, go, it's time for you to rescue my people on that planet called earth. See, we view time from a finite perspective and God sees it from eternity. Now, the first question, are we living in the last days? Here's a recent question I've been asked. Is the corona apocalypse a sign of the end of the world as we know it? And my answer is probably not. Probably not. Make no mistake, Jesus Christ could return at any time He could have returned just now at any moment, at any moment. It's up to him, it's up to God. But I believe God is setting the world up and setting you up for future grace and his glory. And so in our time that remains, I wanna share with you, what is our posture? Assuming you're a believer in Jesus, and maybe you're not, and at the end of our conversation, I'll help you place your hope in Jesus, who is our blessed hope. Assuming you are a new covenant believer that you're not under law, you're under grace, what should your response be? What should your posture be to the return of Jesus Christ? There are three responses that I wanna share with you in our time that remains. Number one, we don't lay down, we wake up. We don't lay down, we don't sleep in, we don't take a nap, we don't bury our head in the sand, we wake up. If nothing else, the coronavirus crisis should wake you up so that you as a follower of Jesus will pay more and more attention of what's really going on in this world. You know, it's much bigger than COVID-19. It's much bigger than Wuhan and a lab in China or whatever might have happened with this virus that got loose. It's much, much more than that. The corona apocalypse should cause us to pay attention not only to what's happening around us, but what's happening not just here, but all around the world to open our eyes. Like a mom who has labor pains, once you start feeling those labor pains, you've got to be more intentional. You've got to pay more attention because something is getting ready to happen in a natural or in our case, a supernatural way. So the Bible admonishes Christ followers to always be on guard, to always be on watch, to always be alert, to stay awake, if you will. The apostle Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians, but you are not in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness, so then, so then let us not sleep as others do, because a lot of people are just drifting, just napping, just sleeping through this, but let us, here it is, let us wake up, let us keep awake and be self-controlled. Sadly, in many ways, I believe the church has been lulled to sleep, has compromised the word of God, has diluted the message of the gospel. And for many people in our culture, in our country and around the world, the church is no longer relevant to our culture. And that is sad, friends. We've got the greatest message the world needs to hear. We have the good news of the gospel. We have the hope that people desperately need, but we because of the way we've acted over the last few decades, people in our culture deem what we have as irrelevant to the lives that they're living. So for those of you who are Christ followers, for those of you who are part of West Cobb community, this grace-filled community of believers here for West Cobb, this is one of the most exciting, incredible times in the history of humanity. And we can be disappointed that we're not physically gathering together, 
but we are still on this mission of the gospel. We are still in multiple ways being the hands and feet of Jesus to our, we just had chicken sandwiches delivered to frontline health workers because of West Cobb. We just had truckloads of food taken to storehouse ministries to help underserved people because we believe that God isn't done and you cannot contain what God is doing in four walls. First and foremost, the events of our day, the corona apocalypse should instruct us not to lay down, but to wake up. There's a second response. There's a second posture that I believe that we should have to the corona apocalypse. If you've been sleeping, if you've been drifting, if you've been lulling yourself to sleep, it's time to wake up. But secondly, we don't dress down. We suit up. I don't know how many of you have been going to Zoom meetings. I'm about Zoomed out myself. I had four Zoom meetings between eight and noon one day this week. I'm about Zoomed out. But in in one of the virtual Zoom meetings, the host of the meeting said, uh, maybe you're not camera ready. And so you don't need to put your face on, on, on this. And what he means is you might still be in your pajamas at home or you might not have makeup on ladies or you might not have your hair comb, men. I never have that issue for whatever reason it might be. But we don't dress down, we suit up. We suit up. We've gotta be prepared for action. I want you to see the Apostle Paul. He's addressing one of the most critical churches in the culture of his day in Rome. Look what he says in regard to this subject matter. Wake up, there it is, a reminder. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So, so, here's what I want you to do. Remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the armor of light because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't dress down, we suit up. Paul's imagery of the approaching day of the Lord is this idea of changing of garments. And if we had enough time to study this, it's the imagery of a Roman soldier who has gone on an all night drunken orgy, if you will. He's still clad in the garments of his sin. He's fallen asleep in his drunkenness and dawn is approaching. And now it's time for him to wake up to throw off the clothes of the night and put on the armor of a soldier of light. You throw off, the Bible says, your dirty deeds of darkness, your dirty clothes, and you clothe yourself with what? With the righteousness of God found in Jesus Christ alone. There's a putting off of your former life. There's a putting away of any deeds of darkness and misdeeds and the illicit things that the world would be about the business of. To be fully prepared for the the Lord's day, for the coming of the Lord. Not only do you put off something that you've been doing, but you have to put on, what do you put on? You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You become dead to the things of the world and you put on, you clothe yourself with with the righteousness of God found in Jesus Christ. Now the armor here, he says put on, he's talked about, he uses that word armor. That's a military battle term, armor. And it reminds a lot of us about the battle that we're in. In fact, between now and the return of Christ, we are locked down in a battle. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, the Bible says. The literally, the, our battle is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the high places. The fact is that Christ is coming again, and that does not mitigate or flatten the curve when it comes to our battle and our desire to be prepared and suit up prepared for the battle. It's why I've often said that the church is not a cruise ship. The church is a battleship. It's going to require all hands on deck. Look what Paul, this is a great reminder from Paul. He says, therefore, therefore put on the full or the whole armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if, but when, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. 
to stand firm. You can't do that by dressing down. You can only do that by suiting up in the whole armor of God, by being under the armor of God. What is our response? What is our posture to the corona apocalypse? Well, we don't lay down, we wake up. We don't dress down, we suit up. The third and final posture or response to the corona apocalypse is this. We don't look down. We look up. We don't look down in despair. We don't hang our heads in discouragement. We look up with great hope. Remember the term that the Bible gives for the second coming of Jesus? Let's look at it one more time. Paul says to Titus, looking for our blessed hope. This word looking for is translated in most major translations as waiting for. But that is the word prosdecome. Prosdecome doesn't mean twiddle your thumbs and sit idly by. Prosdecome is the idea of waiting with increased expectation. It's looking for with intentionality that something is getting ready to happen for you and for me. We are to be looking for our blessed hope. We are to be keeping our eyes open for what God is up to. It's being steadfast, it's being immovable, it's abounding in the work of the Lord Jesus so that when he comes, not if he comes, he'll, he'll come one day. He'll come for some like a thief in the night. He'll come and leave some people behind. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may be next week, it may be next year, it may be next decade, it may be a hundred years from now. We don't know exactly when Jesus is coming back, but I want you to know that we as believers are supposed to be about our Father's business until he comes and that we should always be prepared and always be ever ready and always be looking for with great expectation the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Stand. if Jesus really is coming again, if he's coming back, shouldn't we all just quit our jobs hole up in some Christian compound and eat spam until he returns? The answer is absolutely not. According to the Bible and according to Jesus and according to Paul, the great apostle, they confirm that we are to work and that we are to pray and that we are to worship and that we are to wait and we are to serve and we are to love and we are to give ourselves with every fiber of of our being until he comes to rescue us. You don't sit on your blessed assurance. You don't stop living the life God gave to you. Just the opposite, you live full out, all in, all potential. You go after with God's help, God's goodness, God's grace, and God's glory. During this season right now, I know, trust me, I know, as a pastor, I know, it's a really surreal season. It's like the twilight zone. It's like a lurid bad dream that you wake up and say, man, was I really in that dream? But I want you to know, even though, even though our president declared it a state of emergency, and even though our governor d d d declared it uh, shelter in place was mandated, and even though all of these things have come down, the quarantines and all of that, we don't stop what we're doing. We are still serving the poor. We are sheltering the homeless. We are helping the underserved. We are being the hands and feet of Jesus. And watch this, we're taking the hope of the gospel farther, faster. I had three different responses this week to people who said, pastor, I was just about to throw in the towel. I was just about to give up hope. And then I listened to your talk on how to speak hope, how to trick hope, how to speak to yourself about hope. Oh, my friends, we need hope today like we've never needed, and God knew this. God knew at the end of the age that we would need a blessed hope. Now, the writer of Hebrews actually commands you, if you're a believer, to do something. Watch this. Let us not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but instead, let us encourage one another, and watch this, all the more as you see the day drawing near. What's the day? What's the day he's referring to? It's the day of the Lord. It's the great day of the Lord. It's the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. Some have said that the church doesn't really need to ever come back into a physical space and gather again. 
I beg to differ. We will one day, West Cobb Church, if you're listening in, if you're watching in, one day we will have a glorious face-to-face -face reunion. We will high five and we will hug and we may even shake hands. Who knows what will happen? But I believe that we will be back together again. There are some churches that are saying we're just gonna sell our property and we're gonna go online. I believe that we're going to come back together again because I believe that is part of what God has made us for. He, he made us for a relationship with him and he made us for a relationship with other people. And we're supposed to be doing life together, doing groups together, connecting with one another and a lot of that's going to require face to face if for whatever reasons you like so many American Christians are in the habit of going to church now once a month you are not responding to the command of God in Hebrews you have neglected the meeting of one another and I want to encourage you with I want to challenge you if that's you you say well you know about once and right now you can't even meet at a building basically I mean you could there are a few churches but overall we have these online incredible gatherings and I want to just encourage you. It's easy to skip out, but I want to encourage you to be about the business of your father, to connect with your church and with the people of God. Pastor, when are we going to meet again physically? I'm going to tell you what Jesus said, soon. We're coming back soon. I don't know exactly what soon means, but we're working on policies and procedures and guidelines. We wanna be as socially cautious and responsible, but we wanna take risk for the sake of the gospel and we wanna keep families in mind and the mission of Jesus in mind as we make a determination on how we're gonna reenter our future. And along the way, we're gonna keep on keeping on. We're gonna keep on doing what God has called us to do. How long? I'll tell you how long we're gonna keep doing this thing until he comes, until he returns. In Luke 21, 28, look at this, this is amazing. Now, Jesus' words, when these things begin to happen, look up, look up and lift up your head. Oh, he's the lifter of your head, friends, because why? Your redemption draws near. Your redemption is nearer now than it's ever been. But pastor, I thought we were redeemed from the curse of the law. I thought that our redemption took place 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Absolutely, you're right, it did. You were redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus, by the Lamb of God who was slain for you before the foundation of the world. You have already, past tense, been redeemed by the work of the Lord Jesus. It is done, it is finished. And so when Paul says the word here, when he says that, you, that, that, that your redemption draws near or your re redemption approaches, he's talking, watch this, he's talking about the redemption of your body. He's talking about the redemption of my body. See, Jesus is coming again. And once he comes, there will be no more inflammation. There'll be no more arthritis. There'll be no more cancer. There will be no more headaches. There will be no more Tylenol, no more Advil. There will be no more pandemics, no more pandemonium, no more injustice and no more strife. Everything will have changed because Christ will have come again. Beloved, he says, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You are the righteousness of God if you are in Christ and Christ is in you. Have you put your hope in him? Are you ever ready? Do you know that you know that you know that you are suited up, that you are, you've woken up and that you are looking up for the redemption that is drawing near? Many, many years ago, while on the South Pole expedition, British explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton left a few men on Elephant Island and he promised, I'm going to return one day. I'll be back. Those men never forgot those words. I'll be back. Later, however, when he tried to return, these huge icebergs would keep him from being able to get to his men. However, suddenly, as if a miracle occurred, a small window in the ice began to open up 
and Shackleton was able to get through. His men, ready and waiting, quickly scrambled on board the ship. No sooner had the ship cleared the island that all the icebergs came crashing in where those men had been. They averted absolute disaster and certain death. The explorer said to his men, it was very fortunate that you were packed and ready to go. It's very fortunate that you were packed and ready to go, to which they replied, we never gave up hope. We rolled up our sleeping bags every day and reminded one another, the boss may return today. I'll say that again. We never gave up hope. We rolled up our sleeping bags every day and reminded each other, the boss may return today. Can I tell you, the boss may return today. The boss may return tomorrow. Are you packed? Are you ready? Are you ever ready? Are you awake? Are you suited up? Are you looking for it? Because he could come at any moment. God's goal is never to freak you out. It's only to wake you up. His goal is never pandemic pandemonium. It's proper preparation. This week, as I was praying over who would be watching in, God knew that you would be listening in and that you would need hope to live on. So God says, you need to be looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're a follower of this man, Jesus, that I describe very often, then you need to think about this. You need to let the corona apocalypse wake you up. It's more than just a virus. You need to let it suit you up and put on the armor of God so that you can stand firm in the evil day. And you need to look up and lift your head because your redemption draws near. And if you've never placed your hope in him, if you've never spiritually packed your bags and you've heard me talk about Jesus, oh, he loves you so much that he's given you another opportunity and he doesn't want you to be left behind. There's an old song called, I wish we'd all been ready. The reality is I wish everyone was ever ready for the return of Christ, but people aren't. Uh, Gallup did a survey. 62% of Americans say they believe Jesus is coming again one day, but only 40% say I'm ready for it. Do you see a gap? Do you see a discrepancy? It's an old survey. 22% of the people said, I know he's coming, but I've done nothing to prepare. Don't let that be you. And if that's you right now, you say, Pastor, I want to make sure that my spiritual bags are packed that when it all comes crashing in, that I'm ever ready, that when Jesus comes to take his people, I want to be one of them. And I want to go to that mansion in the sky that he's prepared for me. If that's you, why don't you pray this prayer? God will hear your prayer. Just say, dear God, I want to be prepared. I want to be ever ready for your return. Thank you, Jesus. Tell him that for coming to earth for me, for loving me, by dying on a cross for me, by paying the ultimate price of God the Father's wrath against my sin and shame. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me right now. Thank you for being raised from the dead to live in me. Holy Spirit, tell him that right now. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and live the Christ life in me, that you would live your life in and through me all the days of my life until I die or until you come again to take me home. In Jesus' glorious name, I pray, amen. If you placed your hope in Jesus right now, would you do me and yourself a huge favor? Would you take out your phone right now and just simply text the word hope to 770-738-9766. Text the word hope to this number right here, 770-738-9766. I want you to know that next week we're gonna go part two of Corona Apocalyptic Hope. You do not want to miss the end of the story. It's phenomenal. Thank you so much for joining us today and happy Mother's Day to you. And hey, if you've got kiddos at your house, if you'll go to fourwestcob.com, we've got some amazing Sunday videos for your own kids for you to watch and worship with them in the way that kids hear. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.